Uh, in this video, we're going to take a look at that process of plant evolution that we can find uh, evidence for in the fossil records and start to take a look at this process of um, the algae evolving into plants via that process of natural selection and then how those plants started to change as they adapted to their new terrestrial environment where water is something they still require for the process of photosynthesis. Remember, you need that water in order to get your electrons. Um, you also need water for your gametes to swim, because that's what we find in the algae. But think about these plants that have evolved out there and can live in environments where there's a massive lack of water. So let's take a look as we start to um, explore this plant kingdom that's out there. And if we take a look at this first step for this process where algae move on to land, um, there is some fossil evidence out there that you're looking at something that took place maybe almost 500 million years ago. The algae that were out there started to move on to land. And you can see some of the modern descendants of the algae that are out there that live on the shorelines known as kerophytes. And they think that this algae is the one um, that was the first ones to really start to move on to land. So this would be the modern descendants of the algae ancestor. Remember, we don't have the ancestral organism that is out there. We have the modern descendants of that. The same thing with when we look at chimpanzees and humans. We shared a common ancestor in the past according to this um, theory of evolution and we've both branched off and diversified into the modern iterations of that ancestral animal that was out there. Same thing. These are the modern version of the algae that descended. Some of those um, populations stayed in the water and some of those populations were able to survive on land. And the modern version of these kinds of original um, colonizers of land are known as hornworts, liverworts, and the more familiar ones that we've seen, um, the mosses that are out there. And there's probably about 18,000 species of what are known as bryophytes that you can find today, and they live in very damp habitats that are out there. So they are still tied to water um, because these are the first descendants of the algae, presumably, that moved onto land. So they hadn't quite broken that tie to the water that was out there. They don't have very strong cell walls. They lack that vascular tissue to transport materials that are out there. So these are very, very short plants. Um, and when we look at them, they really lack true roots or leaves that are out there. So they really are very, very similar to the algae that are out there in terms of some of the structures that they have. They have not remodeled the kinds of things we would find in what we would consider the younger versions of these or the more recent versions of the plants that evolved from these kinds of organisms. And when we look at the bryophytes and we consider what kind of adaptations did they have to do from the algae, the major adaptation here is that formation of that waxy skin layer or cuticle to help prevent dehydration. Remember, the algae could absorb stuff all over its surface, but at the same time, if you are absorbing things in, you're going to be losing things out. And if you dehydrate and lose your water, that organism is not going to be able to survive. So at some point, an algae ancestor out there had a mutation that allowed it to develop a waxy layer around the outside, and that allowed those organisms within that population to survive. Um, and you can see this example here shows us a peat bog in Scotland um, that is basically covering this area right here. Notice there's still a lot of water here, and so these are going to be, again, those short kinds of plants that tend to cover wetlands that are out there. They are the direct algae descendants that are out there. They still need water to be able to reproduce um, because their gametes are going to be swimming around. And again, they are short, short plants that are out there. But the other major adaptation that we can see here, 
is their embryos, their children that came from the process, are going to start to be kept within a protective chamber or what's known as a gametangium within the mother plant. Um, and we look at the bryophytes, and here we have an example with some moss. They do something that's kind of an interesting thing. Remember, our algae could alternate between a sporophyte and a gametophyte generation where they had diploid cells or haploid cells. Well, when we look at the moss, they've taken that idea of alternation of generation and they have um, taken these and basically remodeled those stages. If we look at our gametophyte here, this is normally what we see growing in a field of moss that is out there or a field of these bryophytes. And this is the more obvious part. It's green, it's doing photosynthesis. But these are the equivalent of the algae where you can produce the gamete cells. And then growing up from these guys is a slightly different structure over here that is the sporophyte, and it does grow a little bit higher. When you look at these guys, again, think about that idea, diploid versus haploid generations that we saw in the algae, and we're remodeling that. And if we look a little bit closer here, we can see that idea for the moss and how it alternates its generation. And the, basically a switch between diploid or haploid cells that are growing. So here if we look at this thing, we can see our diploid zygote that is formed right here. So there is your fertilization event has produced the diploid cells with two copies of chromosomes, one from mom and one from dad. These cells can divide via the process of mitosis. So you're making clones and they're going to grow up and make your sporophyte generation. Diploid cells that can go through this process of making spores right here inside this little sporangium or sac right there. And those spores are going to be produced through the process of meiosis. So you're going from diploid into haploid cells right here. And similar to what we see with the algae, these haploid cells are able to land in the ground and they're going to be able to grow up via the process of mitosis. So here when you're looking at this, these are the adult individuals that look very similar to what we see over here. Remember, this is what algae do. They can go back and forth between diploid and haploid state. But here, when we look at this process, you can see there's two different versions of our moss that are being produced right here. One of them is what's known as the male version, and the other one is the female version. And here, we can see those protective structures where they're making their um, haploid cells. Remember, this is a haploid individual. This is like a big pile of sperm that's growing here. But now, instead of making... Um, all of these different kinds of haploid cells anywhere on the surface, they are specializing where they are actually producing those cells. So here you have the antheridium, and over here we have the archegonium. This is where the plant is going to start specializing that process of making its gamete cells. So these guys will produce the sperm and then the little eggs right here. And this is where you get that process of fertilization to occur. So they're, ex they're taking their existing structures and remodeling them from the algae ancestor that is out there. And now we can see this switch because those short little bryophyte plants that are out there started to diversify and they started to take up residence um, in the surrounding area there and they started to make some more modifications. Now that they have that cuticle, they can survive on land. And what do they do? Um, about 420 million years ago, again, based on fossil evidence. So you're looking at maybe 70 or 80 million years of those bryophytes colonizing land, and then they started to adapt a little bit further. And now we get what are known as vascular plants that are out there. They're vascular in terms of development of that xylem and phloem. And the other major modification they made is now that you can transport these materials like your sugars and your water and your minerals up and down, you need to be able to develop something to allow you to become an even taller plant. And that's where these plants that had these existing cell walls made of cellulose, which remember is just long chains of sugar, 
that is kind of like making a wall out of bricks. If you think about it, you just start stacking your bricks, eventually you're going to reach a point where it's going to fall down. So what do you need to make a brick wall even stronger? You come up with some mortar and you glue those bricks together. And that's really the equivalent of what we see with this molecule lignin. Lignin is like the mortar for a cell wall to hold those glucose bricks together. And now plants are going to start getting taller and taller and taller. And when we look at these seedless plants that are out there that develop vascular tissue, there's about 12,000 classified species that are out there. And they fit into a couple of different kinds of groups that are out there. We see the mosses here, but these are not true mosses because they do have that vascular tissue. And one example that people are probably familiar with is ferns. And maybe if you've been up to Yosemite, you've seen some things that are known as horsetails. When we look at these guys, they really started to um, flourish during what's known as the Carboniferous period here, um, 400 million years ago. And this would be when you had dinosaurs roaming the planet out there. And they started to grow taller and taller. And when I say taller, we're talking about these things could grow up to 100 feet tall. So your plants are getting really, really tall and they cover the land out there. And when these plants died and then they got buried in the sediment, um, the rock really started to push down more and more on them. And the leftover carbon is what turned into coal that we have available for us today. So when you're burning coal, you are basically burning the ancient remnants of the plants that were around 400 million years ago. If we look at this process for what's going on with them in terms of their generations, they modified it again from what the original algae had that were out there and what developed in the moss. Remember, moss, usually what you see, the most prominent form is that green gametophyte growing all over the place, and now they've switched it. The diploid tissue grows out and makes this really large, what's known as the sporophyte, and the gametophyte that was the major part of the growth is now this really weird kind of structure that is kind of buried in the soil out there. And remember, the gametophyte over here is what's going to be making the gametes that are out there. And if we look at this process again with our fern as an example, we start out over here with the fern that we're used to seeing right here. This is your diploid tissue that's growing. These guys can go through the process of meiosis, and if you look on the underside of a fern leaf, you see these weird kind of brown little structures. Those are actually where they're making the spores inside of spore capsules. Those will drop down to the ground, and the independent spores are going to germinate, and they're going to make this little gametophyte generation here. And within that gametophyte, you will find your different structures right here. This is where you get the production of your egg and your sperm cell. So we're taking these haploid tissues right here, and we are giving specific locations for the production of the gametes that are going to be used in this process of fertilization to go back to our diploid zygote stage that can divide by mitosis. So really the opposite of what we saw with our moss that were out there and the other bryophytes. Now you're switching around your existing structures as you adapt to your new environments. At this stage, the plants were able to adapt even further, and the spores that they had been making were a problem. Because remember, when we look at this process, the spores were still tied to having flagella and allowing them um, to produce sperm cells that could swim through that moist environment to get access to the eggs that were in the female part of that gametophyte generation. How do you get away from that? And one evolution is the evolution of seeds to basically remodel your existing spores that you're producing into something that can survive. And this happened probably about 350 million years ago from the fossil evidence. Plants started to remodel their spores and make some seeds that are out there. And this group is known as the gymnosperms, and there's still seven, 700 to maybe 900 identified species out there. The majority of what we see out there are the conifers. You can also see the cycads and something like a ginkgo plant out here.
And what these guys have done is made a seed that is basically that plant embryo that is packaged into a protective covering. And when you look at this, well, why did these plants evolve this way? And one thing that was going on is the climate became drier. 